Today, I want to talk about computer networks. More specifically, I want to introduce the OSI 7 layer network model, then walk up the model from layer 1 and show off all the cool and eye-wateringly expensive stuff that exists within the world of computer networking. With that out of the way, let me quickly introduce the OSI 7 layer network model. This is an older view of computer networking that splits the networking world into 7 layers. Starting from layer 1 and going up, the layers are the physical layer, data link layer, network layer, transport layer, session layer, presentation layer, and lastly, the application layer. So, now that you know what the 7 layer model is, let's dig a bit deeper and explore each layer a bit more while keeping it as exciting as possible, shall we? There are two common ways to go about teaching people about networking, going top-down or going bottom-up. I was taught top-down using this textbook, but I think that going bottom-up is way more fun when it comes to showing off the cool technologies that are truly the magic saws that make computer networks as powerful as they are today. Therefore, let's begin with layer 1, the physical layer. This layer contains the physical links that connect networking components, whether that be your Ethernet wire, a fiber wire, radio signal, or in the case of Starlink, literal lasers. Additionally, at this level are the transceivers that use the physical links themselves, such as network ports, optical connectors, and more. With that in mind, let me show you this map. This map shows all the submarine cables that form the global internet backbone. Is this a touch to abstract for you? Then here is a picture of the literal cable that is used to carry your cat videos from some server across the globe straight to your phone. And here is a picture of the cable bundle underwater. Now, I won't go into detail of how these cables are laid, but the technology surrounding this industry is absolutely mind-blowing. I'm linking a Quora answer that explains this with many examples in the description. What if terrestrial communication is just boring to you? Well, in that case, you can shift your gaze to the sky and look into Starlink. Starlink is basically trying to make satellite internet a much more common reality, and from my understanding, they use radio and lasers as the physical medium through which to communicate. Okay, that's enough of layer 1, let's move on to layer 2, or the data link layer. The general idea here is that while layer 1 connects two devices physically, Layer 2 connects small groups of hardware devices together. When I say small groups, I mean relatively small compared to the scale of the internet. However, these groups can still be absolutely massive in absolute terms. As an example, a single data center can have hundreds if not thousands of network switches which comprise the Layer 2 network. Oh yeah, at Layer 2, the main devices are network switches. This is where you encounter terms like VLAN, and most devices are addressed by their MAC address. I will not bore you with the details of Layer 2 networking protocols, but I will just drop a couple names you can look into on your own. The Address Resolution Protocol, Spanning Tree Protocol, and Quality of Service. Now, let's look at some cool and expensive stuff. I already mentioned that at Layer 2, you will find network switches. If you're somewhat computer savvy, you might even have one at home yourself. Here is a simple consumer, maybe even prosumer, Netgear network switch that I found on Amazon. This switch has 24 1 gigabit Ethernet ports. Honestly, this is a very high performance consumer switch, but it's unmanaged, and I doubt that it has too many cool features in it. The maximum switching capacity is also unlisted. Anyway, it currently goes for about 160 US dollars. Now, before I proceed, I will make a quick disclaimer as I want to stay on the legally safe side. I'm currently employed by Arista Networks. All the devices I'm about to show, I am showing because I'm just familiar with these products already. The information for each product is acquired from the public Arista Networks website. All the pricing data I found on itprice.com. All statements made in this video are my own statements and are not made on behalf of Arista Networks. Alright, with that out of the way, let's look at the Enterprise and Data Center Network Switch. Here is Arista Network's 7280R2, I know, great name. This switch has 24 400 gigabit QSFP DD ports. It is advertised to handle 9.6 terabits per second of total switching capacity. As for the price, 
I will give you a few seconds to make a guess. Was your guess 210,000 US dollars? Because that's the damn list price for that single network switch according to IT price. However, that's just child's play. It's just a pizza box leaf switch after all, it only handles a measly 9.6 terabits per second of throughput. Let's show you a bigger toy. Here is Arista Networks 7816R3, again, great name. It's quite a large machine and it's also quite new. This switch can have up to 576 400 gigabit interfaces and is advertised to handle 460 terabits per second of switching capacity. That is a lot of bits per second. Matter of fact, this is what it looks like as a number of bits per second written out in full. 460-000-000-000-000 is a massive amount of bits per second. Well, what about the price for this thing? Honestly, I have no idea. Can't seem to find this data. But I would imagine quite expensive. However, I did find the pricing data for an older model. Here is Arista Network's 7516R. It can handle up to 576 100 gigabit ports and has a switching capacity of just 150 terabits per second, which is basically peanuts. Anyway, this thing has a list price of 540 thousand US dollars. Now, this is a spine switch, meaning that all the leaf switches connect to it. One of these can connect together a data center, or at least very large parts of a data center. Anyways, as you can see, computer networking hardware gets wildly expensive. However, this part of the video is starting to drag on a bit, so let's move right on to layer 3 of the network stack, the network layer. I find it at least a bit funny how we're only now starting to talk about the network layer. Anyway, as I said before, layer 2 connects small groups of devices together and layer 3 connects many of these small groups together. The most well-known thing from layer 3 is the IP address. I am sure that all of you have at least at some point seen the description of an IPv4 address. The usual set of 4 numbers between 0 and 255 separated by dots. This is the address of each device when looking through the lens of layer 3. A lot of the internet routing decisions are done at layer 3. This is where things like BGP and RIP exist. Actually, BGP was recently in the public eye because of Facebook withdrawing its BGP routes and bringing all of Meta products offline for a few hours. Basically, the protocols that I just mentioned are used to route layer 3 traffic between and within very large networks or otherwise called autonomous systems. At this layer, the devices that handle traffic are called routers. Now, often when I say the word router, people think of the wireless access point that they have at home. But routers actually are any device that handles the routing of data in layer 3. I will actually not be showing pictures or prices of enterprise and data center grade routers because the networks which as I have shown off already all have layer 3 routing functionality. In other words, a data center router will typically have functionality that encompasses all of layer 1, 2, and 3. With that covered, let's move away from the bottom of the network stack and start to move into the upper layers. Having discussed layers 1 through 3, we only have layers 4 through 7 to discuss. At least, that's what I wish was the case. At this level, the OSI model starts to really show its age, as a very large number of things at these layers have blended together over time. Matter of fact, newer models tend to actually ignore layers 5 and 6 entirely. But I am getting ahead of myself here. I first need to talk about layer 4, the transport layer, as it's actually still very important. If layer 3 connects many groups of devices, then layer 4 decides how the devices actually talk to each other across the underlying network. When talking about layer 4 protocols, you simply cannot have any discussion without talking about the TCP and UDP protocols. These protocols are so important and famous that there exist memes that summarize the protocols for those that know of them. Here is a really famous one. I preemptively apologize for this part being a touch dry, but I will try to make it so that you at least understand how the internet works a bit better with it. 
as I already said, there are two main protocols which are called the Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP for short, and User Datagram Protocol, or UDP for short. The way they work is fundamentally different. For example, TCP is designed to enable reliable communication, and UDP is designed to be fast, low latency, but without any guarantees about reliability. The general idea for TCP is that the two devices on the network establish a session, then transfer information in smaller chunks, acknowledging each chunk's successful receipt by the other device before proceeding further. This protocol is so precise that they even have a system for acknowledging that the devices are done talking to each other that takes four full messages. On the other hand, UDP does not care whether the data comes in order or whether it even gets to the recipient at all. Instead, it just kind of shouts at the recipient and then moves on with its life. Now, you may think that this is a bit stupid, but a lot of data communicated over the internet does not care about having the absolute full picture, so might as well send it quick, hey? So, now we get to the part that is actually quite useful to know. When do you use TCP and when do you use UDP? I mean, the pedantic answer is use TCP when you care to get all the data for sure, and UDP otherwise. But that's not really useful for the layperson. So, when is each one used? I'll answer by giving a few use cases and explaining which protocol is used and why. File transfer uses TCP. I mean, come on, if you lose some part of the file when sending it over, then that file might be straight up useless. Now, since a file is actually a really wacky abstraction, that means that emails, instant messages, and entire web pages are sent to the clients from the servers through TCP. Video streaming and audio streaming, including voice and video calls, however, use UDP. Why? Well, because UDP will typically have way lower latency than TCP due to not caring about reliability. But why do you not care about reliability? Well, that's actually quite simple. Let's take this YouTube video being streamed as the example. I render videos at 1080p 30fps. At least, I think it's 30fps. Anyway, if you have 3% packet loss due to network issues, you will lose roughly a single frame in one second on average. Th that's it. Do you care about that one frame? Or even the subset of pixels that aren't being sent? I highly doubt it. Same idea applies to voice and video calls. And here is another use case for UDP that many people don't realize. Multiplayer video games. Well, at least video games with a decent multiplayer experience use UDP, I hope. Let's imagine that you are making a multiplayer game with a 100-player battle royale where all the physics and game logic happens on your server, and the game clients just handle visuals and user input. Well, you can't really assume that all the players have a good and reliable internet connection. Maybe one person in the game lobby has their router on top of a goddamn microwave, I don't know. Let's see what happens with the game that uses TCP and with the game that uses UDP when that person's roommate decides to heat up a hot pocket. With UDP, the person with a router on top of a microwave lags out completely. They get no physics updates pushed to them, nor do their inputs affect the world for other players. When the hot pocket is done cooking, the state of the world is received, and the player keeps going, with everyone not really knowing that the person lagged out in the first place. If TCP is used as the communication protocol for the game, then when the hot pocket is getting reheated, the world cannot really continue for anyone, as the acknowledgement messages for each data packet sent across the network just doesn't get sent back. Once the hot pocket is ready, that one player's network becomes usable again. At this point, the game can continue, but the lag was affecting everyone. Now, yes, this is kind of bad system design for a video game, but this is not an insanely unrealistic scenario either. Keep in mind, UDP will almost always have lower latency than TCP, so most games just go with that instead for that reason alone. Alright, now that you know what layer 4 does, I will very quickly move on to layer 5, the session layer. This layer is not really used explicitly in modern networking, with TCP and UDP subsuming the functionality of this layer. If layer 4 decides how devices communicate over the underlying network, then layer 5 decides how the devices establish a persistent communication session between those devices. Alright, let's keep going to layer 6, the presentation layer. 
Just like layer 5, this layer isn't explicitly used in modern networking either, with layer 7 protocols subsuming the functionality of layer 6. Basically, if layer 5 decides how the devices establish communication sessions, layer 6 decides on the form and format of the data that is communicated across the underlying network. The most common data format is either ASCII, UTF-8 or UTF-16 encoding. Again, not much to discuss here, so let's move right along to layer 7, the application layer. Now, there is an enormous number of application layer protocols, but the one that I'll present is the one that is used by basically the entire public-facing internet, HTTP or the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. This protocol basically dictates how applications send out requests to servers and how those applications should process the responses to those requests. There are many versions of the HTTP protocol, each one having slightly more modern features. To be honest, since I don't work with HTTP almost at all, my explanation of it will simply not do it justice. Therefore, if you're interested in finding out how HTTP works, then I encourage you to look up other videos to look more into it. And with that, I am done with going up the network stack, so let's wrap up this video. If you stuck around this long and didn't fall asleep, then I would like to congratulate you. You managed to learn about the 7-layer OSI network model, all the while seeing all the cool tech that exists out there at almost each layer of the network. I really hope that you found this video interesting, and maybe even are now encouraged to learn more about computer networks. If that is the case, then consider liking this video and maybe even checking out other videos on my channel. I have lots of interesting videos about computer science, computer systems, and software engineering. Thank you for your time. Bye.